Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Two years ago, I, I had uh, I presented also World of Spar at the end, and we were looking at communities in the East, a Gotamizrach, and I know that I stopped before the end, but I don't know how far I got. And last year I did Poland, so uh, my memory is too fuzzy. If anybody has a memory, did we deal with Yemen? Two years ago? No. Two years ago. No. And did we deal with India? No. 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 Okay. So that's, um, that's where we're going to go. Uh, this is, I mean, for anybody who's geographically challenged, I've included a lot of maps, and uh, that helps me too. So you can see Eretz Yisrael right over here, and so everything east of that is what uh, is euphemistically called a Dokam Israf. And last year, last time, we dealt with a number of those communities. Uh, Georgia is above Turkey here. Uh, I'm not going to talk about these things because we saw them. I'm just going through it. I beg your pardon? I'm not sure we saw Georgia. Well, you should have because it's right in the middle of all these other things. <laughs> It was it was a pretty short run the Caucasus. Yeah, you remember that picture? Yeah. Here's a place called Transcaspiania. And here's a boy from there, but that's the only thing I could find out about that. These areas have changed hands and jurisdiction. I have that postcard in all. Oh yeah? Okay. Uh Uzbekistan is important, especially because uh, of Bukhara. And where we talked about Bukhara. And Afghanistan is just moving a little bit more east. And we come to India. Um, now, I, I'm not speaking to you because I'm an expert in India, um, I've never been there. I don't know a whole lot about its culture, but my focus has been on artifacts, Jewish artifacts from these places, sort of testimony that Jews were once there, even though nowadays not so many are left. Uh, in India, India is a big country, and it has, uh, there are Jews in different areas, Calcutta, Mumbai, which used to be Bombay, and then down in this area too. India has 28 plus states, but these are the centers, and you can see how they're really quite far apart, especially for someone who would have been there in the 16, 1700s. It's significant that they're on the coast because Jewish merchants would be in a position to come to there. So there are basically three groups of Jews in India. One is called the B'nai Israel, one is called the Cochini, and one is called the Baghdad. And then there are a bunch of harder to define uh, mixed blood, um, freed slaves, and so on, converts from years and years ago who have somehow maintained a connection. But culturally speaking, it's these three groups. So the B'nai Israel, 
They may have come as early as by Cheney. You can't prove it, but some of them have that tradition. And their nickname was Saturday Oil Pressers. Oil Pressers because they claim they did that in Eretz Israel, and Saturday because they don't do work on Saturday. And they did have some observance, but uh, many years later and more recently, they learned what uh, traditional Judaism is like from another group, the Kochinis. Some say they were Kohanim. They did very well under the British, um, were mainly in Mumbai, and almost all of them moved to Israel. So there were 24,000 before, before the State of Israel. Today, fewer than 5,000, <laughs> which is still a community. Here's a book that I obtained, uh, which if it hadn't been described as something Jewish, I would have had no clue. But Melech has helped me to translate it. So it seems to be sort of a Kitzur Shulchan for the B'nai Israel uh, community. And it touches on all of these topics, at least briefly. And here's the inside. And this is the only page in the whole book that gave me a clue that it was Jewish. Wearing tzitzis, the father of the child should take the child in his hands and say the following blessing. And we have Lahach Niso. And then we have, and then there's a Shechian. We don't make, Ashkenazim don't make Shechian, but Spartans do. What? Uh, it's Indian, and it's called the, the Marathi style of Indian language, and that's the most that I could tell you about it. But I know who you could ask. Ashkenazim don't say Shechiona because uh, we're causing pain to the child, so it seems unfair, but uh, other groups do. And this is a Haggadah by the same printer for the same community. And this one has some Hebrew in it. Here's an example. You have the Kadesh or Chadzar list and uh, the Gili Yatzon and Mitzrayim. You can see that it has overtones of Sephardic Nusach, but it's a Haggadah. And there's an ad in the back saying, Ba'it Filat HaChodesh, which uh, my Sephardic brother-in-law tells me is a very well-known and popular edition of Sephardic Filat. So these are not Sephardim, but they got uh, a large part of their Jewish education from communities that were, and so that's what's shown in their Minhagim. And this is a picture in the back of the Haggadah giving you a taste of how they would have been dressed in the 1930s. The next community are the Cochinis. And they are down here on the coast. This, this state is called Kerala, and Cochin is one of the towns, and so is Parabur. So the Cochini Jews really have two groups with different origins, but they seem to be making one community. The dark-skinned ones claim to have been there all the way back to Temple times. Uh, Westerners who visited observed them in the 1100s. The light-skinned ones uh, are Sephardim, and uh, they came much later in 16th century. They're called Paradisi, which in Indian, apparently means foreign. They're the foreigners. Now, after 48, see, two things happened in 1948. Israel got its independence, and India got its independence, and uh, which means the British relinquished control of the country. So many Jews did uh, emigrate to Israel, but many others, especially the Sephardim, uh, emigrated to British countries. And so, whereas you had several thousand before, today there's literally a handful. Um, so these communities are dead or almost dead. 
This was their shul. And both groups of Jews used it, but it was built by the Sephardim, so it has their name. You can see the round uh, canister style sacred Torah containers in the Ella Kodesh. Is it being used? It is used, but it's mostly a tourist attraction. It was each, even fear, featured on a stamp of India in uh, 1968. Here again, an outside and an inside. Now, Parur is another town, apparently had a significant Jewish population. According to what I read, it was a rabbinic center with a major synagogue. Population today, two. So, uh, you know, things change. Every time I've shown you a country, I've tried to uh, determine how many Jews are left there. So on the one hand, it, you could say that it's sad. On the other hand, if they all move there, it's Israel. So that's Kibbutz Galiot. That's the way it's supposed to be. Sometimes they simply assimilated or died out, and that's a different story. But this is a lottery ticket for the Va'ad HaChinuch HaIvri in Parur for four Annas. You could Annas are their dollars. And uh, the rules are that you could buy a ticket, and if you win, you're able to buy one of the prices, one of the prizes for only one third of its retail value. So that's an interesting type of a lottery. And if you don't want to buy anything, they'll give you the one third in cash from their from what they take in. Uh, the shul still there? It, it, the building is yeah. there. And the building has been improved. Uh, many countries have discovered that it's wise to maintain their synagogues so that people from uh, tourists and visitors can come and uh, see them. But you don't have any population that could really make use of it. And now come to the Baghdadi Jews. And they settled mainly in Mumbai, which is today called Mumbai. And they settled in Calcutta, which for some reason had to change that name also. So the Baghdadi Jews are very openly, you would see, they're from Iraq. And they are merchants, and they come to the port cities. And they have connections with Jews in other countries all around the Middle East. And their culture is a Judeo-Arabic culture. And uh, they were a significant presence, and they were the most educated of the Indian Jewish communities. But they pretty much left to Israel or to British countries. So today, uh, I'm reading there are fewer than 200 that still remain in those cities. Here is a Sidur. The shul is called the Knesset Eliyahu. Eliyahu was one of the Sassoons, which is Rothschild in India. And uh, so they sponsored many synagogues in the Sephardic world. And so this shul got named after an ancestor. And here it's printed in uh, 1888. And it's all, it's Hebrew and Judeo-Arabic in Hebrew letters. So you see there was a level of education and fluency. There we have to pick the Shema Yisrael L page. What Judeo-Arabic translation? What, what is that Arabic? Judeo-Arabic is like, is Yiddish, is Yiddish German? It's, Lat it's Ladino, it's a mixture of yeah. Old Spanish and Hebrew. And this is a mixture of Arabic and Hebrew. <laughs> There are a lot of Judeo hyphen languages around. Italy also had, I know, many countries that had. Uh, the Sassoon money built a lot of things. In this case, it's a school in a district of Bombay. And uh, the school is still there, but the people in it are not, uh, not many of them are Jewish anymore. Uh, and now I'm just showing you Calcutta. Which is a city with the huge arch that 
so soon to go. Can you at charge? The port, at the port. Yeah. I'm not aware. No, no. This is a birth certificate about five years after the fact uh, for Rafael Haim, son of David. I'm not sure this could say Gurji, which would mean a Gurjistani from Georgia. But these are Sephardim, and they mm -hmm. live in Calcutta, and they have their whole Jewish court that registers. Uh, the citizens you have births, marriages, and deaths of the Jewish community all duly reported. Uh, I found that in 1970 they were down to 50 people. I don't even know what's left there now. I thought Sasong Gabai would get a kick out of this card when I showed it to him when he was here. So this is a rabbi in uh, Old Yerushalayim who is doing what most people who wrote letters did in Old Yerushalayim. They wrote to other communities to ask for charity. So, you know, the yod ki yoker hasheharim etzleinu, which means prices are very high. The gam purim the chag hapesach and Ba'umayim Ad Nafesh means uh, we've had it up to here. We can't. We, we're uh, we're starving. So therefore, even though I've asked you before, please send money again. I like his handwriting style. What year is it? What year? Yeah. Um, February nineteen eighty-two. Um, did I write that somewhere? Yeah, no. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. 1892. Oh, yeah. And now there's Pakistan. Now, Pakistan really was further west, so I could have gone there first, but there didn't used to be a Pakistan. Pakistan was created when the uh, British gained India its independence and the Muslims and the uh, um, no. the uh, Indian, what's the Indian religion? Hindu. 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 So, since they were fighting and murdering each other and so on, so they made a separate peace. So this is E I E C E, not E E A C E. So they still hate each other's guts, but they have separate countries, and this is the Muslim one, and this is the Hindu one. And uh, there were Jews there, especially because it used to be part of India. Those Jews had been Persian Jews, also came probably because of trading, uh, and they came late in the 1800s. And then B'nai Israel joined them. And these are cities they lived in, separated from India, uh, and that started a whole, uh, you know, that along with the Israel war, started a whole bunch of anti-Semitism, so they mostly left. The last synagogue that it was in existence burned down and was cleared out in the 1980s, and so now, to the best of my knowledge, they have no formal building, but there apparently are still some Jews there practicing uh, more privately. And this is an envelope sent from Bombay, very facile, very convenient Bombay, to Peshawar, which was India then, but became Pakistan after they separated. And you have the address in, uh, 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 in English, and you have it in Hebrew, Persian style Hebrew, and you have it in Arabic. So interesting. I know there is a family with this name in yeah. Kenya, well, and I South told myself I was going to try and connect with them, but I didn't. From, he's from South Africa, though. Uh, maybe most recently, but yeah, you know, remember a lot of these Jews went to different British countries when they found it necessary to leave. So, uh, I mean, with a name like that, uh, he's got to have some Persian background in him. 
And this is a postcard that says it's an Israel lady. And I cannot tell you, I'm not uh, proficient enough to tell you which group she might be with. Uh, the coloring looks like it's not plain white, but then again, there are a lot of mixed blood. Okay, we very briefly will go to China, uh, which is about as east as you can get. And uh, this is just to remind you where China is. So there were Jewish traders living here a thousand years ago. And Babylonian and Persian traders made a community. But it couldn't sustain itself. We had heavy assimilation for in just a, a, a few years. No, a few centuries, I guess. That's not fair. And uh, the synagogue is gone and the community is disintegrated. But they were known to the non Jews as the people who don't eat pork and remove the cinder. So you, you know, um, you can tell that there was a time when they were observant and they were known for it. So it's funny, when I, I read, it says there are only maybe 50 affiliated Jews, but there are a thousand with ties to the community, and that means that they are intermarried or converted or whatever, but still have Jewish ancestry. There are very lot of Jews in this world who don't see themselves as Jews, but have Jewish ancestry, a very lot. So yeah. where do you get your numbers at that? Um, this is internet, from the internet. I just look at multiple sources and try to come up with a number that seems to be about right. I mean, we're approximating anyway, but you know, if you used to have 6,000 and now you have 50, it gives you a sense that this community has gone. Now, this arrow points to the community of Pai Fen, and that's where we're going specifically. Yes, Josh. Yeah, um, when, I, when I was in Israel two years ago, I was staying um, in the area of Nachlat Shiva, and I would go to a few little shuls there. Uh -huh. and one place that I went to often had um, quite a few Chinese Jews, I mean, complete Chinese, and they were uh, very religious. They even had a chair there. Uh -huh. They spoke English, and one of them was telling me that he was uh, like a missionary, a uh, uh, the entire Tanakh community in Chinese. Uh, Chinese. Chinese. He's doing Chinese and Hebrew. Uh, he, 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 was he has one. Tanakh. He's making one. He I didn't hear. He was you. making one. Two years making. Ago. I see. Yeah. Who's his, who's his audience? <laughs> he has a. Uh, some people in China, and, and, and there's see. quite a few in Yerushalayim. Um, I'm just thinking, if he speaks English and he lives in Israel, which means he's learning Hebrew, I just don't know who the, who the market is. But, I know. Okay. It's a niche. Yeah, interesting. The Chinese government. Yeah. They eat the normal one. It's hard to believe that the, that the quote, Old Testament, unquote, has not been translated into Chinese. Um, considering all of the, the missionary work and so on. But, okay, so this is a community called Tai Fen. I'm just showing you where it is uh, on the map. And the only thing I can tell you, this is a stamp that shows the, a model. The model is in Beit HaTzfutzot. When I was in Beit HaTzfutzot last, which is some years ago, there's a whole room full of models of interesting synagogues and this is one of them so the, uh, the building does not exist in china anymore but i think there must have been drawings that uh, either missionaries or tourists made and from the drawings they were able to uh, reconstruct it and this is uh, one of a series every year i used to get uh, another strange haggadah I have 25 of them. Yeah, there you go. And this one is from China, from the Kai Feng Fu community. But interestingly, uh, the footnotes and such are written in uh, Persian handwriting, Persian Hebrew, and the Persian language. 
And so it's clear that that is where those Jews had come from and what they knew. Interesting feature, Havdalah before Kiddush, if uh, Yom Tov falls on a uh, Sunday, our minute is to do it the other way, but there is such an opinion. And since your 17th century, you don't have some of the later songs and editions that we are used to. Josh, what do you want to say? I just want to say that um, I was just reading that the, they did a major construction project at Beit HaTzvud, so they completely renovated it and they changed the name of it. Yeah. Changed yeah, the actually, name of it? Yeah, it's not called Beit HaTzvud, so anymore. Oh, okay. That was one of my favorite museums. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> yeah. This one's supposed to be like Boston. So they had Jews, but they're pretty much gone. So we're moving now from uh, the Far East to Yemen. I, you know, I call this far-flung communities because if you're in Eretz Yisrael, these places are very far away, and we'll see even more. Uh, but Yemen, of course, for thousands of years, has had a major Jewish community and strong traditions some of which are uh, unusual to us and are not found elsewhere. Apparently, they came when the Beit HaMikdash still stood. They had contact with other communities. They were strong followers of the Rambam. They copied the Rambam. They learned the Rambam. Look at this number, 70,000 Jews living in hundreds of villages. Now, technically, after the 1500s, they were part of the Ottoman Empire. The, the Ottoman Empire seat was in Turkey, very far away, so there wasn't a lot of uh, hands-on uh, involvement. And the Jews in Yemen suffered persecution endlessly, and particularly once uh, it became a Muslim uh, society, they just didn't let them live. All kinds of rules. You, uh, kids, keep, if kids throw stones at Jews, that's okay. They're just kids. If uh, children should lose their parents and become orphans, automatically they get converted to Islam, and so on and so on. All kinds of prejudicial rules. Now, apparently, in Muslim culture or in some versions of it, taking metal and making it more valuable by making it into jewelry is considered to be part of the sin of usury. And I guess they have those rules or some version of them. So the Muslims didn't engage in jewelry making and that became a Jewish, uh, a Jewish occupation. And that's for the fancier ones and some people were doing more lowly activities. The Aliyah began in 1880 and then, of course, the big, big magic carpet and right after Israel was founded. And so the population went from 55,000 and more before that down to 50, but we'll see something about that in a minute. First, let's just get a taste of the Yemenite Jews there. Uh, a German photographer traveled to Yemen and other countries and he took pictures in the first decade of the 20th century. And he brought his pictures home and they were printed on postcards sold by the Relief Committee for Yemenite Jews. And so the idea was to raise funds by selling these pictures. You should realize that picture postcards became a very big thing, a new big thing, right about the year 1900. And there was this explosion of literally millions of cards on all different kinds of subjects and people would just you know this is before tv people hadn't seen pictures of other places and so a person would buy a card put a stamp on it put an address on it and send it not even with a message just to give the recipient a taste of the picture so these were very interesting to people who had never seen uh, Jews in these places. This is in Sana'a, which is was the capital, is the capital, I think, of Yemen. Here you have Jews uh, in a synagogue. The synagogues were extremely plain on the outside, so as not to attract attention. 
but inside they could have whatever features, tapestries, uh, you don't see pictures, but you see wall hangings. And this picture must have been posed. Uh, first of all, this, the arm cottage is wide open for no reason. And, uh, and they are wearing palaisin, but not filin. They're learning with the mori. Mori is the official title of the rabbi. There's another group in a similar place, and they're all learning from one book. People from Yemen, the early ones who emigrated to Israel, were famous for being able to read Hebrew upside down. Because if their seat in school happened to be on this side of the book, then they saw the letters upside down all the time from the first day that they learned how to read. And this guy was probably good at reading sideways. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a famous thing. There were no printing presses in Yemen. And so you either knew it by heart or you had a book, most likely handwritten. Uh, a rabbinic court, this is a document. I had a hard time with the Hebrew, but there is, it might be Judeo Arabic, but there is some Hebrew in here. And Yahya ibn Yahya. A very popular name in uh, Yemen. Owes 10 reals, that's the money, to Salem ibn Yahya. Uh, and the two rabbis who uh, witnessed the document and signed it. And here you go. It's Friday, the 7th of Tishrei, and the year is 2261. When is 2261? It's not counting from Briata Olam. Because that would be <laughs> that would be three thousand years ago. It's not counting from now. The answer is it's counting from Minyan Shtarot. Minyan Shtarot was a convention that was adopted by Jewish communities from the time of Alexander the Great, especially because he uh, left the Mikdash standing and was kind to the Jewish community relatively. And that's why everybody named their kid Alexander, and it's still a popular Jewish name after all these years, Alexander or Sender. And uh, so the, they started dating their secular documents from 312 BCE. That's from the era of Alexander the Great. So if you do the math, it comes out to be 1949-1950. Tishrei is in the fall of 49. I tried to work out the Hebrew. I find some things. I found here Eser Real, Chov, Yes, Afilu uh, my other. I don't. I can't. Some of the words appear to be Arabic or just words that I'm not making out. But every country that I collected, I've tried to find uh, rabbinic activity and synagogue activity, and then educational activity, you know, a sample of each one. This is a handwritten mahzer for Yom Kippur from Yemen. And uh, oh, here the picture just shows you four kids sitting around one aisle of Facebook and learning to read sideways. Uh, books were scarce and they had to be shared. And if you'll notice here, it says Hashem Sefatai Wait a minute, Tiftach, Ufiyagiti, Latecha, and we're having the beginning of Shemona Esra here, and there are some directions. So I wanted to know what the directions were. So I've, you'll see in a minute I have a Yemenite Siddur published in Yerushalayim, and it has the exact word for word text that we had in the handwritten one. And it's here, it says, Asher Yoshvei Vesecha, Ada Nachman Nevarechcha. The Shliach Tzibur is going to be Motzi, fulfill the obligation for anybody who doesn't know how to daven. And probably parentheses, anybody who doesn't own an expensive handwritten mantra. It's brachos are lengthy. And even those who know how 
have a hard time with the kavana because they're so long. Ela hakol omdim umechavnin b'shomim habrachos kishahu korea kol ha'om korim ve'onim amein achar kol bracha u'bracha. So that's exactly word for word what you have in here, except he threw in zehu b'shom ha'tachalil. Tachalil mean our standard traditional CBA. Do you have the actual original handwritten book? Absolutely. I don't show things that I don't have. Uh, so I tried, I've endeavored to get a book from every community that I've studied. And uh, Yemen was a challenge because there are no printed books. But I was able to locate um, this sefer, which is Sinachzor, and I was very excited to get it. Now and then, listen, a lot of Jews came from Yemen to Israel, and now and then, uh, handwritten books are offered for sale in auction. They bring nice money, especially if they're in good shape. Here's another page from it, I just, just for fun, showing you. Kalei Dever Becher Vra'av Ushvi Ubiza, which is not our Nosach. And down here, we have Avinu Malkeinu, it's an interesting way they made a Aleph in Yemen. Avinu Malkeinu, Kasveinu, Besefer, Parnasav, Chakala. But I'm not able to explain to you what these uh, doodads are here that are in the middle. It must have some meaning. So, first interesting feature was that they used Minyan Pashtarot down to the 20th century. Second interesting thing about the Yemenite uh, manuscripts that when they use Nikud and they didn't in the book we saw before when they use Nikud they used a different type the Nikud that we have the vocalization that we have is called Nikud Tiberiani it comes from Tiberius and that was adopted by most of the world but the Eastern world and Yemen, as we said before, had strong contacts with Babel. They had their own system. In their system, the Nikud is completely on top of the letters, nothing below. And this document, this is actually a leaf from a booklet of some kind of semichot. And I've uh, tried to bring the Hebrew next to it. You can read it on the right side while I read it on the left side. Elecha et vadeh shochein me'onim v'leiv mishpar utfila v'tachanunin. Next line. Roshti lechalotcha adon ha'adonin v'vrei pi ka'azin v'takshiv and so on. It's really lovely and it's not in our liturgy. Uh, but the style, you know, you can tell, but it's a kind of a salita. And this, uh, I have this page, but it's only this page. It's written on parchment, but it's part of a book. There was a, uh, a substantial number of other salita that were part of it. You mean the shapes? Well, um, if you ever heard a Yemenite, an authentic Yemenite, uh, speak Hebrew or say Tefillah, it does have its, what we would call idiosyncrasies. It has its own style of pronunciation. Some might argue that it's more authentic than what we have from uh, our European ancestors. So there are differences, but, uh, but fundamentally, uh, they're using the same set of sounds. They're just writing them a little differently. See, this is a shva for them, and we would call it a pata. You know, here, this is a pata. This is a kamatz. If you try and bend the thing in the middle down a little, you'll get a kamatz. It's not too big a stretch. Tzere is the same. Chirik is the same. Cholam, we use one dot. They use two dots, which we think of in terms of truck, not in terms of reading. 
and this is a kibbutz or shul. We have two symbols. They have the one symbol for the for the u sound. So I can't I can't pronounce it for you the way they do. I haven't heard it enough times to be able to mimic it. Um, maybe there's a YouTube that could tell you. So they have their distinct pronunciation, um, but they're, they're working with the same material, essentially. They just have a different notation style. Okay, here's another Yemenite manuscript. This is the last page of the Sefer Halakha. I needed to do a lot of looking, but I was able to figure out even though I don't know your day by heart, but this in fact is one of the last simanim in Yeradeya on this topic, which is a topic of the kashrut of animals. And after it, here, he says in the Sorah, Mishum, excuse me, oh no, that's not what I want. Uh, I'm looking for the Rambam, here. Moreno Harambam. Right, he adds ve'en lehasir al lehosif al trefo. He says you don't find new things to make treif. The list that we have here is the list. That's the Rambam in Hilchot Shkita, Perik Yud, Halacha Yud Beis and Yud Gimel. The person who wrote this, he's got his name here in a fancy uh, uh, style, is Tenet Ibn Salach. There was a lot of tzalachs, and a lot of yachnes. But here, this intrigued me, Samach Tet. As far as I know, that's not a Yemenite thing. That is a Sephardi thing. Uh, supposedly stands for Sephardi Tahor, and was adopted by Jews who did not convert to Christianity under the pressure of the Inquisition. Other people say it means Siman Tov. But as far as I know, it's a Spartan thing. But then again, Spartan got around, and they could have been here as well. And here again, if you look at the year, it's 2199, which is 1887. And interesting that it seems to have been in a fire. This one is a diploma uh, from a traveling baked din out of Sana that goes to different communities and tests people if they are qualified to be a shochet. And this guy, Yahya ibn Mori Salim Menachem, not only can he shech, he can do nikur, mm -hmm. uh, which is a whole other thing that Ashkenazim have avoided. 1945. I know you can't read that, but I'll tell you what it is. It's a replacement kituba called kituba de erchesa. What happens is Salim and Vidra lost the kituba, and so they come to Beidin because they know they're not supposed to live together until there's a kituba. So they come to Beidin to get a new one, and they say that we lost track of the date when we were married. So therefore, they, did, they dated the new Ketubah to today, the day when it's being written, 1890. Signed, Yahya ibn Mori, Samach Tet, Svardi Tahor. So uh, again, now the print, we would call it Rashi print. That's a misnomer. It's really Svardic print. But it is the Svardic universal style of print, not the distinct Yemenite print that we saw before. Do you know what the K-Tet stands for? Uh, I assume it's Kohen uh, Tzedek Tats. Just a minute. If you see over here, Daud Kof Tzadi. So um, I assume that it means Kohen Tzedek, but I can't be positive. Okay, and this one, this one, he's marrying a divorcee. The catalog that I got it from said that he was remarrying a wife that he had divorced. I don't know if there's any way to prove that from the text. The text mentions that she was a divorcee, that's all. 
Um, okay, so here, um, this is a quite a classic uh, picture of a Yemenite grandpa teaching a grandson. Uh, this picture is probably taken in Israel, but he's wearing traditional clothing and trying to hand down the right way to read Hebrew. Now there's another picture from the Borchardt campaign, getting a family to pose. You see them in their clothing. Uh, they're covered head to toe, the women. You get the impression that maybe they put on their best clothes for the picture. That's something people used to do back when pictures were a novelty. I can't tell if he's wearing Tzitzit the boy, although he kind of looks like he's wearing. But, but the Yemenites had this kind of garment, a shawl-like garment, that went around their shoulders and was not necessarily for Tzitzit, so I can't tell. Here's another of his pictures. Now we have women and children. And you have to remember what the uh, temperature must have been in Yemen at the southern tip of the Arabian Peninsula. And they are all totally covered up. Totally covered up, including, I'm sorry, including head coverings for every single person of every age. And some women are covering their face they don't want their picture taken. I had a grandfather like that. This is the back of those uh, German postcards. In the Landschaft Yemen, in Saudi Arabia, you have 60,000 Juden, and so on. And it gives you the spiel of why you should buy the postcard and support their charity efforts. Here's another postcard of, uh, of some Jews. Yemenitische Juden. Other, see, this is interesting. Here they don't call them Yemenite. Here they call them Arabs. Arabische Juden. Which is fair because they come from the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, but I think it might have had a different implication too. And here are some women's costumes. Reportedly, the coins are a way of keeping track of your money and also possibly a dowry for a young woman. And here's one which uh, is just what's weird is the pipe, which I have found there was few countries that had these very long pipes. I don't know what the benefit of that is. But this is interesting. Here, the Borchardt picture of a Yemenite silversmith in his workshop. Uh, silver and gold work was a Jewish profession, and they imported that profession. They brought it with them when they made Aliyah. So these are original Yemenite pieces of jewelry. They're uh, somewhat in demand today. The one on the right is probably an inch and a half wide. The one on the left is about uh, three and a half inches long. These were amulets. And inside the case, there was some parchment with some uh, mystical formula written on it. I have not tried to open it, although I'm curious. The Ammonites in Palestine continued to be famous, among other things, for their filigree jewelry. And these are pieces that were made in Palestine, belong to my mother, uh, who was there in the 30s. And you can see the kind of work that they do. Here is somebody from Algeria writing to Rabbi Shalom, French spelling, al -Sheikh, who is the, they have him as the president of the community. He was the chief rabbi of the Yemenite community. And this is addressed in French, but it's also addressed in Hebrew up here. Shalom al Sheikh. Um, hey, they were in very early on a strong community, even in the old city. Here now, having transferred to Israel, or having children in Israel, this is a Beit Sefer Tamud Torah Le Temanim. 
And uh, you could see 30 boys all surrounded by the Mori. And I don't know if she's the nurse or the cook or the, what these other guys are doing here, but no doubt part of the school experience. And here, interestingly, this is mail from Yemen to Yerushalayim. And it's addressed in Hebrew and in Arabic. Uh, and the Hebrew is Yehuda Sa'id Amar. Now, it's Yehuda, I'm sorry, Yehuda and not Yehuda because they're trying to avoid the Yud and He and Vav combination since that's three fourths of Hashem's name. Uh, this was a common activity among the European Ashkenazim Jews as well. And it's the Tel Habib, and it's 1934. Uh, a lot of countries in the East put their stamps on the back. Uh, the Universal Postal Union likes to have them in the front in the upper right corner. And especially once there is mechanized mail sorting, they like that. Now, so making Aliyah. This is Yahya bin Yahya from Ukashi and his wife. What's her name? Known as Ra'ayato on the invitation. Uh, no, she's in there. This is a uh, Jewish agency immigration certificate, and they had an office in Aden. We haven't talked about Aden, but we will in a minute. And so they came there. Aden is just a minute. Let's find Aden. Okay, so this is Yemen, and Aden is way down here. It's a little pin prick at the bottom except it's a very important place, uh, especially when the British ran it. So the immigration, they had to walk up from Yemen to, or walk down to Aden, and then they could get their picture took, and they could get this certificate, and they could uh, get ready to go. So he's Yahya, she's Badra, uh, that's a name that appeared in some of the other documents from Yemen that we saw. And there are three kids who didn't make it into the picture. Yahya, of course. Yusuf and Musa. Musa, I believe, is Moshe. Uh, and they came uh, in 1932. But what I love here is that I'm looking at an original, authentic photograph of Yemenite Jews. How many of those could there be? on the bottom of that says the 20th of July. Um, yeah, yeah. that's when they got the documents, but it took them time to make the trip, to catch the boat, to make their way up to Egypt, and then to get over into Eretz Yisrael. Okay, yeah, yeah, this is a Yemenite Sidur, published in 1895, by which time a substantial number of Yemenites had arrived in Yerushalayim and uh, it merited printing a Sidur, probably the first Sidur in the history of the world that was printed for Yemenite tradition. And it's two volumes with everything you need. And uh, Josh, can you read that for me? Kiminhag? Kiminhag Kotilot HaKodesh Teman. Teman, that's it, okay. So uh, it's from 1895. When I showed this to Yechiel, I wonder if Yechiel is a version of Yahya. When I showed this to Yechiel, he said, oh yeah, it's Baladi. It's not charming. So I didn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Baladi is Arabic and it means uh, from the homeland, domestic, traditional. There were some newer inroads in Yemen uh, a tefillah that was being influenced by the Kubalin uh, from the north. Now, Sham is the Arabic term for the northern Levant, going up to Eretz Israel, Syria, Lebanon, those places. 
And so they had a different Nusa, and that was making inroads. And so you could tell right away from the Gefiel's indignation that uh, they were frowned upon, and this was the real deal. The Baladi, if you look at it very carefully, is similar to the Ashkenazi. The Shami is very uh, influenced by the Sabbath. So which Sardin would it be that gave them that input? People, which was the closest uh, community to Vienna? Not Vienna, not uh, Minsk. It was no. Cairo. Okay. Uh, true. true. All right. Thank you. Okay, found this on the web. The last three Jewish families in Yemen were deported by the Houthi rebels, leaving only four elderly Jews in the country. Uh, now, I don't have it here, but those families went to Egypt as a way station, figuring out where they want to live. And Rabbi Faiz Gradi in America told Yuthay Naman that the Jews who remain behind have refused to leave due to their fear of educational and smear issues. They heard from their brothers who made Aliyah before them and understand that Israel is not for them. The U.S. is also not appropriate for their lifestyle. So they're searching for an Arab country that would agree to accept them. Okay, and just for your edification, the Houthi officials forced Jews to sell their home for low prices. And the Houthi slogan reads, death to America, death to Israel, curse to Jews, victory to Islam, welcome to them. So there's nothing left. There's nothing left. They did, uh, as of March, there were four Jews known to be there. Um, I mean, that's the fact that uh, so many thousands moved to Eretz Israel is a wonderful thing. Um, but it is kind of the end of, uh, of a very long era. Now, Aden was um, a more modern, and a, a, an important part of that was that the British had a port there. Even though there had been Jews there forever, the British came in 1839, and they made it like a mini colony and port for the, over the next hundred years. The Jews there could claim British uh, citizenship. There were Arab riots, and the British actually evacuated the Jews in 67, probably right after the Six Day War. So the population was up to 8,500, now it is zero. That's Aden. But Aden had a printing press. And so anything that was going to be printed in that part of the world had to be printed in Aden. This book, Petach Ohel, The Doorway to the Tent, Laws of Divorce, and then other laws related to engagement, marriage, and the Sheva Brahma. I don't know if that's an antidote or what. I don't know how they worked that. But it was seen as important enough to be printed. Uh, See, it's from the community of Tzanna, which is in Yemen. But it had to be printed in Aden. There's another book, Lit Sefer Esther Hamalka, De La Shon Aravi. It's a commentary on the Gilad Esther, entirely in Judeo Arabic. And the author says, I found this manuscript in Yemen. So again, we see that Aden is the place for getting things printed. Here's a letter sent from Aden Camp. Aden Camp was the port uh, that was totally controlled by the British, and they had military uh, base there. So this, I'm sorry, this envelope is registered, which probably means that it had money in it, and it's a, my finger, and it's addressed in Arabic and Hebrew and English to the Hibshush brothers in the market in Jaffa. The Hibshush brothers were big, big, big time merchants in the whole region. And uh, this was just one of their little stores in Jaffa. 
and it's addressed to Samuel. No, no, it's, it's coming from M. Samuel in Camp Aden. There's the registration. It's okay. 55 pounds sterling. That's a lot of money. And here's one written in Hebrew and it read for the uh, the Habrit Ha'ivrit Ha'olami, which was a kind of an organization that promoted Hebrew around. And uh, I don't know if this person, Mr. J. Ben David, I don't know if he was a resident, if he was a soldier, if he was a tourist, I don't know what he was, but he's writing to uh, Tel Aviv. Okay, I'll skip that. And this is a letter on a, uh, an airgram. It's it's on it's on business stationery, but it's a personal letter in uh, what we would call regular Hebrew. And uh, interestingly, it says on top, "Yiskulushanim Rabot," which is a classic Sephardic wish, usually heard around Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur time. But this letter was mailed in April, so he probably had Pesach in mind. Um, and uh, it's about, it's chit chat of the family. He's writing to his daughter, and among the things he says to her, speak only English to Uri. He'll learn Hebrew soon enough from the children. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that this struck a bell with me because my kids in Israel speak English to their children. First of all, they want their children to hear good English, and they do not want them to hear not that good Hebrew. So this way, you can learn English at home and Hebrew in school or on the street. And finally, from Aden, this is what's called a shekel, which was the name given to the receipt when you paid money to the World Zionist Organization to be a member. And that, of course, is how they funded themselves but it also gave the communities the right to send delegates to their conferences. And they tended to print these receipts in the communities where they were collecting the money. Last year when I was talking about Poland, I showed some from Poland. And so this is Suleiman Abraham Namar, um, collected in Tafshin Ched. But that's a very interesting date because uh, the Jews tended to leave there, and uh, by 1967, they were gone. How are we doing on time? 710. Uh, I put in Djibouti, because who ever heard of it? But look where it is. It's just across the pond from Yemen and Aden. So Djibouti is an African country next to Ethiopia. And apparently, some Yemenite traders went there and did business and had shuls and rabbis. They all left. Oh my goodness. Okay. Uh, that's what happens when you type English, but the computer is set on Hebrew. And it does say that there were 500 Jews who were evacuated to uh, Eretz Yisrael. And the reason I'm telling you all this, because I have a postcard. Mm -hmm. Djibouti, Atelier de Orfebvre Juif. Okay, this is the Jewish uh, goldsmith's workshop. Okay, I don't know if we'll finish this, which is my minhag. But I want to start it anyway. So we did the East. We did all the places I could think of that I could obtain something from that was from the place. Uh, because that's my criteria, that I have something from there to show that Jews were actually there, not just stories and uh, pictures. Now, Jews went to Western countries uh, as a result of the Inquisition. Uh, and they chose Netherlands and England because those countries were uh, Protestant and therefore they were more tolerant than the Catholic countries 
There was no inquisition in these countries. Um, it doesn't mean that they were dyed in the red blue Jew lovers, but they were tolerant. And it allowed Jews to uh, come and to thrive. This is a shul, the shul in Amsterdam. Um, and uh, Spanish and Portuguese Jews arrived there in the late 1500s. A lot of them held on as um, secret Jews, which can be called crypto Jews or Moranos or Conversos, uh, meaning Jews who lived outwardly a Christian life, but maintain their affiliation with Judaism. So they, a lot of them hung on as long as they could. But when they found that they were able to go to these other countries, they went there. Um, later, Jews from uh, Central Europe came, and so the community became uh, more Ashkenazified. This shul was called the Esnoga, which is Ladino, their Ladino term for synagogue. It's Spartic, Orthodox, Portuguese. And like most of those from that time, it had candelabras, sand on the floor. And this shul, when Jews emigrated from here to the West, this was the image of shul in their mind, and therefore they would pattern their smaller synagogues after it. This is another one of those models. Seats face in, not forward. The Aaron Kodesh is a much more elaborate triple affair. And the Shulchan from which the Torah will be read is in the back. Here's a calendar from Amsterdam from 1769. <laughs> it's actually not exactly a calendar. It's a booklet for calculating the Hebrew calendar for the next 112 years from 1769. And it's in Hebrew. That's Portuguese. That's Portuguese. Yeah. We'll read that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can help us out. Here it is. Yeah, that would be Portuguese. Make sense to you? Yeah. Old Portuguese. <laughs> Old Portuguese. Well, it's 1700s. <laughs> I suppose Portuguese has changed a little. And when Moranos came to Europe, did they, as a rule, go back to living outwardly with Jews or not? Um, um, substantially, yes. First of all, because those who had been hiding their Judaism as opposed to just giving it up really wanted wanted to remain affiliated. And now that they were free and they could dab in and they could have a congregation, so they did it. So generally speaking, we're going to see a number of communities like that. Uh, and they generally did. Some didn't. Um, a whole talk could be given just on the Inquisition and how uh, foolish and counterproductive it was. But all right, that's not right now. Now, so the, the Amsterdam became a center for Hebrew printing. Here we are in 1771, and we're printing a Mahzor, Sephardic style, and hey, the man in charge is Shmuel Rodriguez Mendez. Rodriguez is a very common Sephardic converso name. Um, in fact, I was I read somewhere that almost all the names that end in S like Cortez and Mendez and so on, are uh, Sephardic names, uh, Spanish names of people who hid their Judaism. Uh, and here, um, okay, so this is all happening in Amsterdam. And I refer you to uh, Ali Shaft for more of this kind of book. Um, Amsterdam has a rabbinic court the Portuguese Jewish community. They did Sephardim, is what it says in the stamp. This one is from 1949, recent. I'm supervising the Marcus workplace and their meat is 100% kosher when it bears my seal. And the name, again, is Rodriguez Ferreira. It's another Sephardic family. 
Now, England had expelled its Jews in 1290. And any Jews you found in England in the 1400s were uh, hiding very, uh, very deliberately. Uh, because there was no... And then I spear three. Say it again. The, the three of the fear, the, the fruit, spread it up, fear three, yeah. the spear. Yeah. 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 Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And what is Rodriguez? <laughs> That's Spanish. <laughs> We're not responsible. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Menashe ben Israel, who was uh, one of these Renaissance people, he was a rabbi and a Kabbalist, and he printed newspapers, and he was a diplomat, and he founded the first print Hebrew printing in Amsterdam. He did all kinds of stuff. And he got in his head that if we want to bring the end of days, Jews have to be in every country. And he sold that concept to the leaders in England, especially Oliver Cromwell, who was temporarily the head of England when England did away with its monarchy and had a commonwealth for a few years, right exactly about now. And so uh, uh, Manasseh ben Israel was able to persuade uh, Cromwell's uh, people to be tolerant to the Jews. And so, even though it wasn't exactly official, that became the beginning of the new Jewish community in England. And this medal was made not that long ago to uh, commemorate the uh, 400 years of, excuse me, the 300 years, 1957, <coughs> of Jews returning to England. And here you have what may be a portrait of uh, Cromwell, and here's what Manasseh ben Israel was reported to have looked like. But he was wealthy, and he might have had his portrait painted. So that if you really want to see what Manasseh ben Israel looks like, what he was very good friends with uh, Rem Rembrandt, and uh, he had uh, it's a beautiful etching. Uh, there you go. Uh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. So the Jews are coming back to England. This is a postcard of the main Spanish and Portuguese synagogue, which was called Kahal Kadosh Sha'ar HaShamayim. And the building itself is from 1701. Before that, they were just hanging out in somebody's house. And it's inspired by the Esnoga that we saw in Amsterdam. And so it has some of that same feel, elaborate or in Kodesh. I mean, candles are candles. They didn't have light bulbs yet. But still, the furniture, the arrangement, and this shul is still going, and it's still smart, which cannot be said for all, for every other example. Uh, it's called the Bevis Marx Synagogue because it's on a Bevis Marx Lane or something. You see a pretty uh, unobtrusive place there until you go in, and then you see this. Here, from that shul, Kahal Kadosh Sha'ar HaShamayim. We have a prayer sheet that was printed during World War II, 1939. And it's in Hebrew and English and for all the Spanish and Portuguese synagogues. I just took a little quote from the English side. Sit on the seat of mercy, hear the groans of our children, help our defenders overcome their enemies, destroy those rising against us, give us salvation soon. And this was also Montefiore's shul. This is Sir Moses Montefiore. The family lived in London, but they were originally Italian and used to go back there. I think he was born there. Uh, Sephardic. Um, wealthy, brother-in-law and partner of the Rothschilds. But he's famous in Israel for being a benefactor to the poor. He made seven trips in these years when making a trip was a big deal. And he didn't travel alone. He was wealthy, he had his wife, he had servants, he had all kinds of people with him. And he, would, he was responsible for some of the buildings you see in the old city, the famous windmill, uh, which now is a museum with his carriage in it. And this is his personal stationery. He had stationery for England, but he used other stationery when he dealt with Israel. There's his name. 
And this is his autograph. He didn't write the Hebrew. That was written by um, by his uh, secretary. But he he, he signed it. Uh, and this is a uh, lovely and desirable item. And there's a little uh, kind of keychain medalette that was made for him. Hasar Hanadiv Moshe Matafiori Zichron Tzidkat Kizrono Yisrael. We remember how he uh, dis distributed funds uh, and so on. All right. Now, the title was Far Flung Communities. We are now crossing the Atlantic Ocean. And, uh, and my daughter think this is a Yiddish word, far from, but it's not. It's in the dictionary. <laughs> far from. When you fling somebody far away. So, from the perspective of Europe and from Eretz Yisrael, this is pretty far. Uh, we saw how far east they went all the way to China, how, so, how far south they went all the way to Yemen, and this is now how far west to the New World. Now, it seems, I've read it multiple times in multiple places, that there were Jews who were part of the explorers who came early on. They were secret Jews, of course. They wouldn't have been able to uh, identify themselves properly. Uh, but the Dutch and the Portuguese had uh, fighting back and forth, in tr and the Dutch was a major power in those days, and was trying to colonize as much as the French and the British and the Portuguese were. Everybody wanted a slice. That's why you have British Guiana, French Guiana, Dutch Guiana, and they're all next to each other because everybody wanted a piece. So here, the Dutch captured Brazil, captured Brazil, and the Jews lived freely because the Dutch, as we said, are very tolerant. They have a congregation called Tzur Yisrael, but in 1654, the Portuguese take control. And not only does that mean the Dutch aren't ruling, it also means the Jews have to go because Portugal also equals inquisition and they cannot stay. So the Jews flee to the Caribbean and to North America. So let's see what we can see. The famous one is 1654, 23 Spanish Portuguese Jews arrive in New Amsterdam from Brazil. Now, I underlined arrive because it ain't that simple. What happened is there were about 600 Jews in Brazil who had to leave in 1654. They left on 16 ships which is about 40 to a ship, it seems like a reasonable number. And they set sail to go back to Holland. 15 of them arrived. One of them got blown off course and got lost. It got lost and it was come upon by pirates who took the people and the belongings and sank the ship and now they were making their merry way. However, they in turn were found by a French ship, and the French ship did away with the pirates and took these Jews with them. They made their way to America, to New Amsterdam. And so these 23 Jews who expected to arrive in Holland arrived in New Amsterdam with no money, no belongings, no furniture, no anything. And what's more, the French uh, captain of the ship insisted that they pay for their passage, which of course they had already paid when they had set sail for Holland. And so they had no money. So they were in bad shape. There were court cases. Some of them were thrown in debtor's prison. Because you know, if you're in debtor's prison, it's very easy for you to get the money to pay off your debts. <laughs> Never understood that logic. But eventually things worked out and they stayed despite the fact that uh, Peter Stuyvesant hated their guts and made their life miserable and they had to write to the uh, Dutch 
West at the Dutch West Indies Company, which had Jewish stockholders, and so Peter Stuyvesant was told to behave himself. Uh, things were not no, simple. Was, what? No incident before then? Uh, there seemed to be some mention or traces, but nothing that we could substantiate. Um, so these are them, as far as we know. Now, in 1664, the British took over and it became New York. So that was the end of Peter Stuyvesant. And as we already said, the British were becoming more tolerant. So things were going up from there. So the congregation was called She'erit Yisrael. And uh, it, was, it existed early on, but didn't really formally organize till 1730. They built the shul and they built a few more re, uh, redone. And eventually they built this building uh, over here on uh, Central Park West in 1897. And that is the Spanish Portuguese synagogue of the day, even though it's very hard to find Spanish and Portuguese Jews in it, but they maintain the tradition. Um, Jews also, not many years later, made their way to uh, Rhode Island. And there, 15 families arrived from the Caribbean. They started a shul called Yeshuat Israel, Spanish Portuguese, colonial style furnishings. Eventually, most of them are Ashkenazim. But every year, just to remember, they have an annual Spanish and Portuguese Shabbat. Um, yeah, well, yeah, you know, 15 families cannot uh, maintain itself against hundreds and hundreds that eventually come. There's a curious trap door in front of the bima in this shul. And some say it was just a symbol of the freedom because back in Spain, they used to have to hide uh, their Jewishness from many observers. Others say that they feared that things might go south here, and so they wanted a place to hide. And there is a rumor that it was actually used for the part of the Underground Railway, which is a euphemism for smuggling escape black slaves up into the north, but no one's ever been able to prove that. Another early Sephardic community in America is Philadelphia. They had traders early on, but when the British occupied New York as part of the Revolutionary War, more of these Jews escaped to Philadelphia. Many of them had identified with the revolution and therefore they saw the British, not from a religious point of view, but from a political point of view, as enemies, and therefore they uh, ran away to Philly, which had its own congregation, Sephardic synagogue, and so on, all kinds of traitors, traitors, okay, and a few traitors. Now, here's a newspaper from Philadelphia, and look at the by the way, in this paper, they put the ads on the front page because that's the main thing people wanted to see. The news was in the back somewhere. So here's Leon Moses, he's a broker. That's a Spartan Jew. Here's Benjamin Nonis and company. He's a broker, he's a Spartan Jew. And here is Moses Cohen, he's a broker, he's a Spartan Jew. And you just get a taste of what they were doing and the fact that they were very present and visible at the time. And uh, one of the ads says, doing business in the US, Europe, and the West Indies. West Indies is big because a lot of Jews who ran away from Brazil set up communities in the West Indies. And that was important because there was a lot of trading going on, uh, especially in sugarcane and also in everything. The Philadelphia Jews tended to be patriots. That's why they ran away from the British. The, uh, the, the government created something called continental currency, which was basically IOUs that they used for money to finance the war. And uh, some of them took a beating, like this one, but you can read what it says. Six Spanish dollars, dated November 2nd, 1776. And it is hand signed by Benjamin Levy, a prominent colonial leader. All of these notes were hand signed, usually by two people, 
and the purpose was to prevent counterfeiting because anybody with a printing press could make these things they weren't that sophisticated here's an interesting feature that was invented by ben franklin he found a way to make prints in lead out of out of uh, vegetation leaves now that'd be very hard to uh, um, counterfeit unless you had the original leaf um, so that was put on the back as another counterfeiting feature and many of these notes I don't see it here many of them say to counterfeit is death meaning if you were caught you were executed printed by Hall and Sellers but Hall's original partner had been Ben Franklin the two of them were in the printing business now we come back to New York to Mordechai Manuel Noah, a nut, but he had an influential one. He was a diplomat, he was a playwright, he was a judge, he was a surveyor for the Port of New York, and in that capacity, he was the one to issue and sign, well, he signed it with a rubber stamp, this bill that says it was imported into this district, uh, in the American ship Isabella, da da da, one box of tea numbered and marked, uh, containing 20, uh, 12 pounds. So, this is their way of keeping track and uh, the taxing if there was tax and so on. So, why is he important? He's important because he got in his head one day we need a place for Jews that they'll be safe. So, he went and bought an island in the Niagara River called Grand Island, and he named it Ararat. Ararat, of course, was the uh, spot on which Noah Teva landed, uh, giving him refuge, so to speak. And he was going to have all Jews from everywhere who wanted to, to come there and live there and be safe. But it never happened. Um, the cornerstone that he wanted to use uh, is in some museum in New England. I forget which one. And then there's South Carolina, Charleston, another major Sephardic Jewish community in America, if major means having a few hundred families. The S&P Jews arrived in the 1600s. Tolerant, trade, Kahal Kadosh, Beit Elohim. This was the largest, wealthiest Jewish community in North America. It had hundreds to start, and it eventually swelled to 2,500. That's a lot in those days. Francis Salvador was a British, uh, he was a Sephardi from a family that was in Britain, arrived in 1773, joined the uh, revolutionary uh, spirit, and next year he's already elected to provincial congress. And he actively joins the fighting and he is killed in the fighting in the Revolutionary War. He is known as the first Jew to die in the Revolutionary War. Um, South Carolina was a major Jewish community. So we, we have Newport, New York. Um, uh, what did Philadelphia. I just do? Philadelphia. Philadelphia, thank you. And uh, now we have uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, another one that I don't have anything from right now is Savannah, and another one is uh, New Orleans. These were the major Jewish communities in this country before the immigration of Jews from Central Europe in the mid and late 1800s. Oh, and here's the shul in uh, Charleston. Kahal Kadosh Beit Elohim. It was Spanish Portuguese Orthodox then eventually influenced by Germans who came and who introduced reform, and that's what it is today. Uh, I would like to zoom in there, and uh, you say that in the 1800s, the main street was closed with the clothing covers. Because all the stores were owned by, there's a number of places like that in this country, mm -hmm. yes, that's interesting. I take it you've been there? Yeah. Nice. Now, the most famous Jew in the Confederacy is this guy. Judah P. Benjamin. He was born in the West Indies, and he made it to New Orleans, then he came north, and he was a buddy of Jefferson Davis. And so he, he, uh, he had become a lawyer. 
he became uh, an officer in Jefferson Davis's government. First, he was the Secretary of War, then he was the Secretary of State, and it is as the Secretary of State that his face appears on this note, this Confederate bank note for $2. And, um, and you can see from the imagery how the northern states are oppressing the southern states and therefore have to be resisted. Look what it says here. Six months after ratification of a treaty of peace between the Confederate States and the United States, the Confederate States of America will pay two dollars to the bearer. And this is 1862. So the Confederates lost the war and he ran for his life and ended up in England. Um, but pretty cool to have a Jew on the face of paper money in America. Uh, had to get statue. The, what? They got rid of the statue. Uh, they got rid of everybody. <laughs> Emma Lazarus is from a sport, a Spanish Portuguese family in New York City. Did uh, charity work with the with refugees, and of course is famous for the poem that is uh, inscribed in a plaque on the Statue of Liberty: "Give me your tired, your poor, and so on." All right, I think I'm going to stop here because the rest of it is the West Indies, and uh, you'll have to wait a year to see that. <laughs> <laughs> or not. We'll see. All right, I appreciate you your attendance. Yes, well. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I don't have anything from there. That's the rule. I have to have some.